Hello and welcome back. Our next speaker is Nokia's own Karol Przybylski. He works as a software developer in the team responsible for creating the physical layer of Nokia 5G platform. His interests are embedded technology and applications. In his spare time, he likes to search for absurd humor and play story heavy games. Let's see if we're going to witness this humor or any heavy stories in his his talk. So, how it's done sorting algorithms. Karol, over to you. Thank you, Rafał, for your introduction. And hello, everyone, and thank you for choosing to come to this presentation. My name is Karol Przybylski, and this is how it's done, sorting algorithms. And uh, let's dive right it into the topic by asking two simple questions. First one, how to put that many LEGO objects in order before parents notice the mess? And I assume that they are waiting right at the door. And the second one is how to put an array of million integers in ascending order in less than a second. As you might have already guessed, the, guessed, the answer is by using efficient sorting algorithms. And the second real life use case of sorting algorithms is online shopping. When I do my on online shopping, usually the first thing I do is I choose how the data is displayed to me. And usually the vendors will push you to buy their products by featured or relevant, whatever that means. And usually the most beneficial for you would be to choose something ordered by price or by customer reviews. So the end choice of what you are going to buy will be influenced by how the data is sorted. And there are billions and billions of such sorting operations going on in the world every hour, every day. So we need to make them as quick, as efficient as possible. And also, there is a lot to learn from the implementations of sorting algorithms, because they are almost as old as computer science itself. The quicksort was developed in 1959, merely 12 years, years after the invention of transistor. And there were so many people working on those programs, genius software engineers, and I'm sure that we have a lot to learn from them. And let's say that just for fun, we would like to develop a new sorting algorithm. Because if so many people before us did it, why shouldn't we? Am I worse engineer than, say, Donald Knuff, father of the analysis of algorithms? Yes. So the task at hand is following. We want to develop a new sorting algorithm. But before we actually start doing this, we should ask ourselves three questions. How to do it well? How do we know that the program we wrote uh, is actually OK? How pe people before us did it? And how people do it now? And these are the sort of questions that it's nice to ask every time we start doing something new in order to not reinvent the wheel. So first, let's talk about the characteristics of a good algorithm. And uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I actually thought that there would be some community approved checklist or something for how a good computer program should look like. But nothing like this exists. It's very subjective and depending on the use case. So I'm going to present to you what I think, what is most commonly agreed characteristics of a good computer programs. And the first one is that we need to remember to satisfy the business logic. Look at this photo. One of those people just wrote an excellent algorithm. It's not the best, it's not the worst, but what matters is that client is happy. And they are having the best time of their lives. <laughs> so it's important to satisfy business logic and to do what the client wants. That's the most important. And the second one is, is that our so solution should be correct. And by correct, I mean correctness in the sense of computer science, which can be defined as for each input, it produces an output satisfying the specification. So for some number of input uh, arguments, we want to always have a predictable and correct result. And how do we know it's true? Obviously by testing. And we can never test something to 100%, but we can try. And uh, this weekend I was uh, watching some baking show and a baker was asked, how does he know that the, the cake he's baking is good? He answered, I only know this because I have tested it a thousand times and I understand the basic principles of it. And it applies to baking, it also applies to computer science. 
And the third characteristic is more technical and perhaps uh, usually the most looked upon, so time complexity. And basically, time complexity describes how fast our algorithm runs in terms of number of operations that we need to perform in order to compute some result. And usually it follows the big O notation, so O like, oh my god, what a quick program. And then between the parentheses we have a complexity expression, which describes the number of operations for number of input. So say, for example, we have, I'm sorry, we have O of n, and that means that for n elements we need to perform n operations. That is linear complexity. And here we have a graphic representation of complexities. The best one is the blue one, the logarithmic complexity. And this is the complexity of, for example, binary search algorithm. So if we want to find a number in a sorted array by using binary search, for an array of 100 elements, we would need to perform seven operations around, in the worst case. On the bottom axis, we have elements, and on, on the left axis, we have operations. Then we have linear complexity, then n log n, and finally n squared. Each one worse than the previous one. And uh, for sorting algorithms, it's, ba it's basically impossible to achieve uh, logarithmic complexity because there's too many comparisons, too many swaps going around. So the next in line is linear complexity. So let's find an algorithm that actually has linear time complexity. Perhaps it will be good for our use case. But uh, as you might already guess, only looking at the best case time complexity might be a pretty bad idea. So let's examine the sorting algorithm called Bogosort and how it relates to Qsort. And the time complexity of Bogosort is linear in the best case and Quicksort has n log n. So only basing on that, we would say that Bogosort is better because it has a be better worst uh, time complexity. And here we have this plotted on a chart. So it is clearly visible that n log n is worse than linear. So we would like to choose the linear. And now let, let's examine how Bogosort code look like. So it is like this. As you can see, it's pretty simple implementation, very elegant. And uh, what happens here is basically until our array is sorted, we are shuffling the array around. So switching the data places randomly. And if you are extremely lucky, this would compute instantaneously if you have uh, luck for random numbers. But we would need extreme amount of, amounts of luck in order to achieve that. And uh, in reality, the worst case complexity for this implementation uh, is actually a factorial. And I didn't even plot factorial before because uh, then other complexities would not be visible. It would be pretty terrible. And for this implementation, actually for an array of 10 elements, we would need to perform that many operations. I'm not even going to attempt to read this number. But as you can see, only going by time complexity in the best case uh, is a bad idea. We have to also look at uh, other characteristics, other factors. And last but not least, we have space complexity. And basically, it describes the amount of memory that our program is using. And it follows the same notation as time complexity. For example, here, linear space complexity. The more input we have, the, me the more memory we need. And to sum up quickly the characteristics, we want our program to fit the requirements, so do what we want. We want it to be accurate, so do what we want correctly. We also want to have good time complexity, so do computation quickly and we don't want to take up too much space. And space might be especially important if you are working with uh, memory constraint environments like embedded systems and the like. Sometimes then it might be beneficial to choose time complexity, space complexity over time complexity. And moving on, we are now ready to answer the second question. So how people before us did it? What can we learn from our ancestors. And our ancestors 
where sorting arises around using quicksort. And quicksort is actually not, not a single algor algorithm, but a family of closely related ones. Because the various implementations have some differences, like for example, the scheme of choosing pivot uh, while sorting. So there is not a single version of quicksort. There are a lot of them, but the principles are, are the same. And quicksort is also the default al algorithm in many programming languages like C++, C, or Java. And uh, average performance is n log n, and average space complexity is the same. And now for a little story, story time, because I think it's quite interesting how uh, quicksort was conceived. The year is 1959, and imagine a dark room where a young British student is sitting in his dorm at the University of Moscow. And uh, he wants to learn the Russian language. And in order to do that, he has to translate words from the Russian sentences using a dictionary on magnetic tape. And in order to scan the translations in one go, he has to sort the words from the sentence in alphabetical order and do it quickly enough. And so, this way, he came up with the idea of quicksort. So, again, he had a real-life problem, he had a set of requirements, and he decided to solve it with an algorithm. That's pretty ingenious, if you ask me. And uh, I don't expect you to remember all the details of how quicksort works, but uh, let's do a quick refresher. It will not be very hard. So first order of business is to choose the pivot element. Then we are putting the elements greater than pivot on the right and elements less than the pivot on the left. And first step, we have received subarrays and we are sorting these subarrays using quicksort until the right they are sorted. And we should remember that an array of one element is considered sorted. And usually when people start learning about quicksort, about how ingenious it is, two things pop into their minds. First one is, wow, how could anyone possibly come up with that idea? Usually quickly followed by, okay, explain it to me one more time, please. And we are going to do just that. So let's imagine we have an array of integers, six integers, very simple, very easy, and we want it to sort using quicksort. So first we find the pivot element. In this case, it will be middle right element, so seven. Then we are reordering the elements. So elements less than pivot on the left, elements greater than pivot on the right. We are sorting in ascending order. So five, one, two, lesser than seven, then nine, ten. It checks out. And then we are repeating the process for the subranges. So we have two subranges and we are choosing the pivot value. For the first, first subrange, we will choose the rightmost one, two. Then we have seven, the previous pivot, and then nine, nine and ten. Ten is the pivot value. And again, we are reordering the values around pivot. We have received a result, and actually we are done because the array is sorted. Obviously, this is very simple, simplified case, but in principles, it works exactly like this. And now let's talk a bit about how actually we should choose pivot value because this is pretty crucial for performance of quicksort. And we have a few options to do that. First, was, first one is always choose the same pivot. And this is not a bad idea. In the original implementation of quicksort, always the rightmost element was chosen. But actually this can degenerate from n log n to n squared when we are dealing with almost sorted arrays or some other killer cases. It's not a good idea. Then we can choose pivot randomly. But if you are going to do that, then we are going to deal with all of the overhead concerned with choosing random values, generating them, are the values good enough? And still you can generate killer cases which will greatly reduce performance. So we are going to go with the number C. We are going to be smart computer science hackers about this. And the smart way to choose pivot is actually to do it via a method called the median of three. And how we do that is following. We are choosing the rightmost, leftmost, and the middle element. And the pivot becomes the median of those values. So here we have example. We have the same array as before. 
six numbers, we are choosing five, one, and ten, leftmost, middle, and rightmost element. Those are those. And the median of those elements is five, so our pivot becomes five. Very simple, but actually just proves how ingenious quicksort is. And to briefly sum up the, sum up the characteristics of quicksort, this algorith algorithm is recursive because we are calling the function within itself. It's also divide and conquer. So what divide and conquer basically is about is that we have a starting big problem and then we divide it into sub-problems, which are smaller. We are solving those sub-problems. And once we have those sub-problems solved, we can solve the big problem. Very good technique. You can also apply it to your daily life. Very useful. And basically, it's choosing the pivot value, reordering elements, rinse and repeating. And now let's talk about the QSort implementation in an actual programming language, the implementation in C, and what can we learn from it. And so, just as we have Cerberus guiding the gates to the underworld, also at the gates of Quicksort we have a warning, which read, reads as following. If you consider tuning this algorithm, you should consult first engineering a sort function, software practice and experience. And uh, this I have to say, while the reading C code is not, not particularly easy, there's a lot of useful comments throughout the code of Quicksort in GCC, describing almost every step, every more, more complicated step of the implementation, and you can learn a, a lot from them. And uh, if that's not, not enough, you can always go to this article, consult it, and then it's 16 pages, uh, it's very well written, their authors describe every trade-off that they had to consider, the design choice, choices, what they decided to do, what they didn't decide to do. It's really, really helpful, and uh, this code is actually well documented. As opposed to the implementation of sort in GCC in C++, because comments there are not particularly helpful, and I'm, and I'm going to prove it. So first we have this. We have the definitions of sort function in C++ GCC, and the command is sort. Not very helpful, I think, but okay, maybe this is for some text reading or something. Then we have this command. This is a helper function, dot, dot, dot. And I guess they added dot, dot, dot for suspense, for the thrill of reading comments. I I have a hard time understanding. I know this is a helper function, but I would like to know how is it helping us. And the third one is doc to do. This controls some aspect of sort routines. I'm sure it does control some aspect of the sort routine, but I would like to know which one. But at least they put a to do there, so it will probably get fixed someday. And now we can talk a bit about magic numbers in computer programs. So generally, when we are studying computer science and the programming, we are always told that magic numbers are something bad, that every number should be taken from somewhere, should be proven and reliable. But in Quicksort and in real life meets Fiori, and actually here they are using magic numbers for this purpose. This continue Quicksort algorithm when partition gets below this size. This particular magic number was chosen to work best on a sun 4. Define max fresh 4. So this is very important magic number. We are going to talk ab about this in a bit. And authors had to choose some number, and they chose the one that fitted best their hardware architecture. This is still in the code to this day. Nothing really changed since 1993. So perhaps this is a wrong value, but it was good enough, they had to choose something, so they went with a magic number. So if you have to use magic numbers, sometimes there's no other way. And actually Quicksort is not Quicksort, but Quicksort and friends. Just like with this composite material, which contains in itself multiple materials to make even stronger and better thing, also in Quicksort the implementation is actually a hybrid. And uh, at the end of quicksort, when the size of array to sort is small and it's almost sorted, we are using insertion sort because it works well for small and mostly sorted arrays. And actually the magic number size of array 
items are sorted this way. The max fresh from the previous slide. And uh, this is a good lesson about teamwork, because quicksort works good in general, but for this particular case it fails. So he needs a friend in search and sort, which is terrible for almost all of the cases, but for the case of small mostly sorted arrays. And remember when I told you that, that quicksort is a recursive algorithm? Well, it actually isn't, because this is taken straight from the documentation, non-recursive, using an explicit stack pointer that stores the next array partition to sort. And yes, in general, in computer science textbook, quicksort is described as a program that is recursive, but it isn't, because the authors looked at it and said that recursion is not beneficial, we are going to do this the iterative way. And again, real life meets fury. Okay, they say that it has to be recursive, but it doesn't really because performance is more important. And that's right. But while we're at it, so we can talk a bit why sometimes it is not beneficial to use recursion. I think that this is a programming technique like any other. So if you have a good use case, you can use it, no problem. The functional programming comes to mind. But some people that it is harder to debug when you are using recursive functions. But quicksort is anyway hard to debug and hard to read. So what does it change really? Uh, one thing that uh, might be important is that recursive functions uh, cons consume more stack space. So if you are working with constraint environments or something like this, then it might be good to think about it, what uh, consequences this might bring. And now let's see the stack implementation that was mentioned on the previous slide. And uh, let's go quickly through that code. So first we have a type, type def struct which describes the stack node with low and high parts of the partition. Then we are defining the stack size. Then we have the definition of push method. So the method to, for adding the new elements to the stack. And we have this beautiful void. Then we are updating the low and high elements of the top of the stack and incrementing the stack pointer. Then we have a method for popping an element from the stack, that is removing the element from the stack. And also void, this is C, decrementing the stack pointer and updating the elements. And then final method, stack not empty, health method for determining if the stack is not empty. And what came to my mind when I was looking at this implementation is that it is very lean. I like solutions that are lean, that are very efficient, and in here you have everything you need and nothing else. No error checking, no nothing, just raw data structure. You know, the, <laughs> this is how adults program performant data structure. Only this what you need. And uh, while it's not particularly easy to read because it's a macro, actually defining is it as a macro will cause it to be inlined. So it will be very fast and very performant. And if you are learning C, you try to learn how to write a good macros, you don't have to go to some shady online tutorials. You can look at the GCC implementations and you will find a lot of examples there, how to write a good performant macro. And uh, let's look at the usage. This is taken for the, from the great tool called Godbolt. And this is the x86 disassembly. So as we can see how this is used, it takes only a few instructions to create stack and to push some value to it. Very performant, everything is inlined because it's a macro, so there are no jumps, extremely fast implementation. And now let's talk about a bit uh, how the median of three is chosen in quicksort. So basically it starts like this. We have two variables, two pointers, low and high. Low is the pointer to the base of the array and high is the pointer to the last element of the array. And the middle element that we need to compute the median of three is calculated like this. We have the low pointer and we are adding to the base pointer the number of elements in the array divided by two. And what happens here exactly is that high minus low is the number of elements in the array. It's a bit hard to read because of those size words, but actually we have to use size in order to account for the size of the pointer. And uh, there is no division by two. Nobody divides by two in such low-level implementations. You have bit operations. 
And also what you can notice here is, is that Quicksort in C works on a very low level of abstraction. There is basically none. We, we are doing raw memory, raw charts, you know, accounting for pointer size. Uh, it gets pretty tricky to, to make it right by it, but that's how the calculations are done. And continuing on with the implementation of Median of Free, here we have typical wonderful C code. So we have a bunch of function pointers, void pointers, which are pretty dangerous to use. And no sane, sane person would use them in the software today unless they have to. It's, it's not easy to read, but a careful reader might notice something interesting. And th that is it, the usage of GoTo. And usually when you are talking to someone about GoTo, some programmer, the first thing that he will tell you is that go to, more like go to jail, you can't use this. Or we should define at the top of the project file, go to send resignation letter. Because uh, when you are learning programming, I was always told that go to is something forbidden. This belongs to the 1970, never use this, you can never write good programs using go to. If you use go to, then goodbye. But actually there are some cases where go to can be quite useful. And we are going to examine those now quickly. Go to is used to cleanly exit a function for exiting nested loops and sometimes for low level performance. And for exiting nested loops, here is the example. We have nested array, basically iterating over a two dimensional array. And then we have some conditional statement. And if that conditional statement is meant, then we want to go to some label and do something. And this is pretty popular case for using goto, because goto is uncond unconditional jump. So basically the best for performance. Of course, you can get around it by writing smaller functions and using return statements. But in C, usually it is done like this because it's the fastest. And also for the error handling. So what we have here is we are defining a bunch of variables. We are doing some operations with memory, allocating some memory, opening some files. Both of those operations can go wrong. And if something goes wrong, then we want to go to error label and do some cleanup, free the memory, cross files, and return some value. And this is maybe the most popular case of using goto. If you don't believe me, you can check out this example from kernel, from GitHub repository. Exactly the same case, something happens that was not predict predicted, I mean, something that shouldn't happen. And if that happens, we want to go to some error label. And there's more than 100 pages of this, so thousands and thousands of go-to is actually in the wild. And if that is not enough for you, in C++ also go-to is used. In LLVM project, we have go to in sorting algorithm. And the same way, we want to go to some label where when certain condition is met. So even C++ uses go to. And uh, if you want uh, in, uh, to read an absolute banger, you can read the structured programming with go to statements by Donald Knuff. It's a pretty long article, pretty long book about programming with go to statements. You can send it to your buddies each time you commit uh, go to to your repository. And now let's quickly remind how actually the prototype for QSort looks like. And it looks following uh, in order to sort some array using QSort, we have to give the base of the, an array, number of members, the size of each member, and then a pointer to the function that would do comparisons for us. And uh, I think we can all agree that this is perhaps not the easiest to read design. It looks very 1970s. And most people learning how to program or programmers that like languages on higher abstraction level actually don't like it. And some even get very mad about this. And here is a slide from Bjarne Stustrup presentation from 2012, going native. And he actually gets really mad about the interface to QuickSort. 
and he's ranting about it for several minutes. And here's his slide. If you want to use, to use quicksort, you would do, do this in this way. And it doesn't know how to compare doubles. It doesn't know the size of the double. And it doesn't know the size of the number of my elements. No, why? In modern languages, modern sorting functions, usually the computer can figure those out. But in C, it's not so easy. You have to give them explicitly. And there is some right to it that using quicksort in C is not particularly easy. It doesn't look par particularly nice. So the future is now. C++ is coming. It already came. So we are going to talk now about how sorting algorithms are done now. And here's the screenshot from CPP reference. We have a few sorting algorithms av available. And one of them is sort. And the second one is stable sort. And we are going to be focusing on those two in this talk. And now let's see how std sort looks under the hood. And uh, if you are look, looking at the standard for the C++, what are the requirements for the sort function? This is the main requirement. Random access iterator shall satisfy the requirements of value swappable. And uh, sort actually uses random access iterators, which are, I think, the most popular iterators in C++, because for them, an operation of adding an integer to the iterator is constant time. And using random access iterators uh, also means that quicksort, the sort function, will not work for linked lists. And then we have the effects that the sorting function should have. And uh, they are pretty obvious. Sort the elements in range from first to last. And lastly, we have the complexity that is required from this program. So it's O n log n. Comparisons where n is last minus first. And what matters here is that up until uh, C11, it was the requirement for average case complexity. So old quicksort would have, would have been fine. But then it changed to complexity of the worst case. And if you want to, want to have an algorithm that is good in the worst case, then according to the creators of QSort in C, if worst case performance is important, quicksort is the wrong algorithm. So we need to have a new one that will fit the requirements. And the new algorithm is IntroSort, which is also QuickSort and Friends. So first we have QuickSort, which has the n log n complexity for messy and shallow arrays. And by messy, I mean that arrays that are not really sorted, because for sorted arrays, we would use insertion sort. And uh, shallow means the recursion level is not very deep, so we are not making recurrence many times. And here's the graphic aid for quicksort, because the rockets are quick. Then we have heap sort. The, I will not go in depth with what heap sort is. But what is important is that heap sort is good when the recursion of quicksort goes too deep. And this is the graphical representation of a heap. And then, like in the previous case, we have insertion sort, which is good, which is best for almost sorted arrays, and pretty bad in any other case. And I couldn't find the picture of insertion that would be safe for work. And this is the library implementation uh, from GCC of sort function. And uh, we are going to go through, through this. OK. So first, this is the prototype of the sort the template. And it takes two random access iterators to first and the last element from the range to sort. And then we have the function for, for comparison. And already we can see that the interface to sort is way easier than the, well, well more, more elegant than the interface to quicksort. Then we have the basic checking of the condition if, the, uh, if there is anything to sort at all, because we don't want the first and the last element to be the same. And then we are entering the intro sort loop, which is quicksort plus heap sort. And once that finishes, we have almost sorted, sorted array. We are finishing with final insertion sort. And that's written pretty, pretty cl clearly. And then uh, if we go to the def definition of intro sort loop, 
uh, things get interesting here. For the first thing, we have a while loop. And actually here, we can finally see what this S threshold actually controls. So if array size gets below 16, then we are sorting it with insertion sort. And up above, we are sorting with quick sort plus heap sort. Then we are checking the depth of the recurrence. If it reaches zero, then we, we are switching uh, to the heap sort in here. And then if it doesn't, we are continuing with quick sort. And actually in here, we can see that there is recursion. We are calling the function within itself. And that's basically how intro sort looks like. And one thing that, one thing that comes to mind when we are examining the the sort functions, the implementations of sort function is the usage of prefixes and postfixes. So basically wherever we look around, we can see that always the prefix operator is chosen and no postfix. And uh, actually there's a pretty good reason for that. And uh, just to quote from the Google C++ guide, use the prefix form plus plus i of the increment and decrement operators unless you need postfix semantics. And yes, that is true. It's the most beneficial to use the prefix because prefix is never less performant than postfix. Because with postfix operator, we actually first need to make a copy of the array and then increment or decrement it. And while this will not matter for, for types like integers or doubles because the compiler will optimize it anyway, it might matter for more complicated types, like user-defined types, classes. Generally, the best way is to always use prefix operator. And now let's examine how quick sort of the old compares to std sort of today. So first of all, std sort is safer. You saw all those void pointers and uh, unsafe comparisons and so on in quicksort. That's pretty dangerous design. In that case, stutzort is way safer. It's way harder to break something using it or have some security threat. Also, it's way easier to work with objects. Quicksort in C is nice for sorting arrays of integers of doubles, but if we want to work with some more complicated objects, things in C, it gets really messy and really complicated. So with std sort, it isn't complicated at all. Sorting is pretty simple to do. And of course, std sort is way faster. And we are going now to examine why std sort is so much faster than quick sort, because it is. And first thing is it has better algorithm. So in the first case of quick sort in C, we have quick sort and some friends. One friend to be specific, insertion sort. And in the case of std sort, we have three algorithms, which gives us better worst case complexity. And also the important reason is inlining. And you would think that when it comes to inlining, maybe C would be better because it works on the lower abstraction level, but it doesn't because for many reasons, uh, C cannot leverage newer programming ideas that can be leveraged in C++ because QSort uses function pointers for comparisons. And std sort, if we, we were sorting an array of integers, it would use std less operator, which would be inlined. So we would be comparing integers with each other directly in case of std sort. And with quick sort, each time when we, when we want to perform comparison, like you saw in the code with the median, we would need to call the function pointer, so make a jump, jump compare them and then, then go back. And it produces tremendous loss of per performance. And call from std sort can actually be inlined, no jumps, it will be very fast. In most cases, std sort is at least two times faster than quick sort, and some sources say that it can be as fast as seven times more than quick sort from C. And now we can talk a bit about uh, stable sort, last but not least. The main algorithm for it is merge sort, which is n log n. And the main requirement, well, the only requirement besides sorting for stable sort is that the order of e equivalent elements must be, pers must be preserved. And what this actually means, we are going to examine on uh, a piece of code. 
So here we have a definition of struct sandwich and we have calories per 100 grams, and then the name of the sandwich. And then we are defining the less than operator. Basic operator just compares calories of two sandwiches. And then for the usage in main, we are defining the vector of sandwiches. Ham and cheese, Big Mac, cheese and ham. And the order of the equal elements is important. And here ham and cheese and cheese and ham and are equivalent. We are stable sorting them and then producing the output. And the output should be that the equivalent elements are preserved. So this is exactly what happens. Ham and cheese, cheese and ham, Big Mac, exactly in the order that they were declared. And in quick sort, the sort function, not stable sort, this is not guaranteed. They might be switched around because to preserve the relati relative occurrence, you have to sacrifice some of the performance. And finally, slowly coming to the end of this presentation, we already know how it should be done. We've talked about the characteristics of a good algorithm. We know how people who used to do it. They used it by using quicksort and, quicksort and some friends. And we know how we do it now in C++. We use quicksort and even more friends. And basically, we have just scratched the tip of an iceberg because there is so much more to it. We have team sort, which is an algorithm that it, that it was written basically for Python. And it works really well for some machine learning cases. We have shell sort, radix sort, comp sort. Each of those algorithms is in some way useful and we can learn something from it. And my key points for this presentation are that there are no programming dogmas. Because as we have seen in the example of quicksort, everything done in theory should be, the quicksort denies it. Like you shouldn't use go to, well, the implementation of a performance algorithm which will show you that if you want to do it, you can do it if it pays off. And also there is a lot to learn from the implementation of algorithms because many smart people, many genius software engineers were working on them, so we can learn a lot from them. And also the best algorithm is two algorithm, algorithms or more. And on that positive note, that teamwork makes the dream work, I would like to end this presentation. Thank you very much for your, att for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Karol. This was Karol Przybyrski sorting algorithms for us on behalf of the algorithms and our audience. I'd like to say that we all now feel sorted. This is uh, Nokia's own conference, Code Dive 2021. Stay tuned for more. <laughs>